I'm pleased to introduce Alexander Weinstein. He's the director of Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing. He's the recipient of the Sustainable Arts Foundation Award, and his stories have received multiple awards, including the Lamar York, the Gail Crump, the New Millennium Prizes, and it's been nominated for the Pushcart Prizes as well. Um, he's an associate professor of creative writing at Sierra, Siena Heights University and leads fiction workshops in the United States and worship, uh, United States and Europe. Um, it was interesting talking to him over lunch and hearing how this has been a dream of his. And so it's really exciting to have him here for his first book, Children of the New World Stories. Please join me in giving him a, a warm welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, here's the plan. I'm going to read a story and then open up for any questions that you have. Uh, I'm really excited to be reading here at Google because so many of these stories deal with technology and the kind of weird landscapes that technology provides for us. Uh, this story is called Openness. And I think the only thing that I need to say about this before I go in is that there is a kind of psychic technology going on in this story. And so people don't tend to speak anymore in this world. Instead, they communicate this way. And so to indicate when they're communicating telepathically, I'm going to put my fingers up here so that you know the difference between when they're actually speaking and when they're uh, sending messages this way. Openness. Before I decided to finally give up on New York, I subbed classes at a junior high in Brooklyn. A sixth grade math teacher suffering from downloading anxiety was out for the year, and jobs being what they were, I took any opportunity I could. Subbing math was hardly my dream job. I had a degree in visual art for which I'd be in debt for the rest of my life. All I had to show for it was my senior collection, a series of paintings of abandoned playgrounds stored in a U-Pack shed in Ohio. There was a time when I'd imagined I'd become famous, give guest lectures at colleges, and have retrospectives at MoMA. Instead, I found myself standing in front of a class of apathetic tweens, trying to teach them how to do long division without accessing their browsers. I handed out pen and paper so that for once in their lives, they'd have a tactile experience and watched as they texted, their eyes glazed from blinking off message after message. They spent most of the class killing vampires and orcs inside their heads and humoring me by lazily filling out my photocopies. The city overwhelmed me. Every day I'd walk by hundreds of strangers, compete for space in crowded coffee shops, and stand shoulder to shoulder on packed subway cars. I'd scan profiles, learning that the woman waiting for the end enjoyed thrash hop, and the barista at my local coffee shop loved salted caramel. I'd had a couple fleeting relationships, but mostly I'd spend weekends going to bars and sleeping with people who knew little more than my username. It all made me want to turn off my layers, go back to the old days and stay disconnected. But you do that, you become another old guy buried in an e-reader, complaining about how no one sends emails anymore. So I stayed open, shared the most superficial info of my outer layer with the world, and filtered through everyone I passed, hoping to find some connection. Here was City Cat 5, Jersey Girl 13, M3 Love. And then one morning, there was Katie, sitting across from me on the end. She was Lake Girl 03, and her hair fell from under her knit cap. The only other info I could access was that her home was her hometown and that she was single. Hi, I winked. And when I realized she had her tunes on, I sent off an invite. She raised her eyes. Hi, she winked back. You're from Maine? I'm planning a trip there this summer. Any suggestions? She leaned forward and warmth spread across my chest from being allowed into her second layer. I'm Katie, she winked. You should visit Bar Harbor. I grew up there. She gave me access to an image of a lake house with tall, silvery pines rising high above a shingled roof. Wish I could help you more, but this is my stop. 
As she stood waiting for the doors to open, I winked a last message. Can I invite you for a drink? The train hissed, the doors opened, and she looked back at me and smiled before disappearing into the mass of early morning commuters. It was as the train sped towards work that her contact info appeared in my mind, along with a photo of her swimming in a lake at dusk. It turned out that Katie had been in the city for a couple years before she'd found a steady job. She taught senior citizens how to successfully navigate their layers. She'd helped a retired doctor upload images of his grandchildren so strangers could congratulate him and had assisted a 93-year-old widow in sharing her mourning with the world. Her main challenge, she said, was getting older folks to understand the value of their layers. Every class they ask me why we can't just talk instead, she shared as we lay in bed. Though Katie and I occasionally spoke, it was always accompanied by layers. It was tiring to labor through the sentences needed to explain how you ran into a friend. Much easier to share the memory, the friend's name and photo appearing organically. At least they still want to speak. My class won't even say hello. You remember what it was like before, she asked. I tried to think back to high school, but it was fuzzy. I was sure we used to talk more, but it seemed like we doled out personal details in hushed tones. Not really, I said. Do you? Sure, my family's cabin is completely out of range. Whenever I go back, we can only talk. What's that like? She shared a photo of walking in the woods with her father, the earth covered in snow, and I felt a sharp edge of jealousy. Back where I grew up, there hadn't been any pristine forest to walk through, just abandoned mini-marts, a highway, and trucks heading past our town, which is more a pit stop than a community. The only woods were behind the high school, a small, dangerous place where older kids might drag you if you didn't run fast enough. And my parents sure didn't talk. My mother was a clinical depressive who'd spent my childhood either behind the closed door of her bedroom or at the kitchen table doing crossword puzzles and telling me to be quiet whenever I asked her something. My father had hit me so hard that twice I'd blacked out. My history wasn't the kind of thing I wanted to unlock for anyone, and since leaving Ohio, I'd done my best to bury those memories within my layers. So I spent our first months sharing little of myself, Katie showed me the memories of her best friends and family, while I showed her the mundane details of substitute teaching and my favorite bands. I knew Katie could feel the contours of my hidden memories, like stones beneath a bedsheet. But for a while, she let me keep the private pain of my unlocked layers. That summer, Katie invited me to spend the weekend with her dad at their cabin. We rented a car and drove up the coast to Maine. We listened to our favorite songs, made pit stops, and finally left I-95 for the local roads. It was late in the afternoon, our car completely shaded by the pines, when our reception started getting spotty. I could feel my connection with Katie going in and out. Guess we might as well log off, Katie said. She closed her eyes for a moment, and all of a sudden I felt a chasm open between us. There was a woman sitting next to me whom I had no access to. It's okay, babe, she said and reached out for my hand. It's still me. I pressed my palm to hers, closed my eyes, and logged off too. Her father, Ben, was a big man who wore a puffy green vest that made him appear even larger. And you're Andy, he said, bearing my hand in his. Let me get those bags for you. He hefted both our suitcases from the trunk, leaving me feeling useless. I followed him into the house, experiencing the quiet Katie had told me about. There were no messages coming from anyone, no buzz posts to read, just the three of us in the cabin and the hum of an ancient refrigerator. The last time a girlfriend had introduced me to her parents, we'd sat at Applebee's, making small talk from our outer layer info. But with Ben, there were no layers to access. All I knew were the details Katie had shared with me. I knew that her mom had died when she was 14 and that her father had spent a year at the cabin grieving, but that didn't seem like anything to bring up. So I stood there, looking out the living room window, trying to remember how people used to talk back in the days when we knew nothing of each other. Katie says you've never been to Maine. I haven't, I said, the words feeling strange against my tongue. He walked over to the living room window. The afternoon sun shimmered on the pond, making it look silvery and alive, and the sky was wide and blue, pierced only by the spires of red pines. 
Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, I said. The fridge hummed, and from the other room I could hear Katie opening drawers and unpacking. I wasn't sure what else to add. I, I remembered a detail she had unlocked for me on one of our early dates. I heard you've caught a lot of fish out there. You like fishing? He asked, placing his hand on my shoulder. Here, I'll show you something. Ben retrieved an old tablet from the closet and showed me photos on the screen. There he was with Katie and a string of fish, him scaling a trout in the kitchen sink. We scrolled through the two-dimensional images one by one like people did when I was a kid. Katie came to my rescue. Come on, I want to show you the lake, she said. Dad can wow you with his antique technology later. One day you'll be happy I kept this, he said. Katie's baby photos are all on here. He shut down the device and put it back in its case. Have fun out there. Dinner will be ready in an hour. Outside, Katie led me on the trails I'd only ever seen in her layers. Here was the gnarled cedar that she'd built a fort beneath, and over there was the rocks she chipped mica flakes from in second grade. We climbed down the banks of the trail, holding onto roots that jutted from the earth, and arrived on a stretch of stand speckled with empty clamshells, mussels, and snails that clung to the wet stones. Far down the beach, a rock outcropping rose from the water. A single heron stood on the peak that broke the shoreline. There was something beautiful about sharing things in this old way, the two of us walking by the shore, the smell of pine sap, the summer air cooling the late afternoon. And for the first time in years, I wished I'd had a sketch pad with me. As Katie spoke, her hands moved in ways I hadn't seen people do since childhood, gesturing towards the lake or me when she got excited. I tried to focus on each sense, sentence, sensing my brain's inability to turn her words into pictures. She was talking about the cabin in autumn, logs burning in the fireplace, the smell of smoke, leaves crunching underfoot. Are you even listening? She asked when I didn't respond. Sorry, I said, I'm trying to. It's just that without the ding, it's hard to know when you're sending, I mean, saying something. I stopped talking, hating the clunkiness of words, and took a deep breath. I guess I'm just rusty. Katie softened. I know. Sometimes when I'm in the city, I can't remember what it looks like up here without accessing my photos. It's kind of messed up, isn't it? Yeah, I agreed. I guess it is. The heron hunched down and then lifted off, its wide wings flapping as it headed across the lake away from us. That night, her father fried up the perch he'd caught earlier that day. The herbs and butter filled the small cabin with their scent, and we drank the wine we'd brought. After dinner, Ben brought out a blue cardboard box, and the three of us sat in the living room and played an actual game. I hadn't seen one in over a decade. You don't know how to play Boggle? Katie asked, surprised. The point, she explained, was to make words from the lettered dice and to write them down with pen and paper without accessing other people's thoughts. I sat there trying to figure out what Katie was feeling as she covered her paper with her hand. What do you think? Katie asked after the first round. It's fun, I admitted. You bet it is, Ben said, and he made the dice rattle again. When Katie and I were in bed, I listened to the crickets outside the screened windows. It had been a long time since I'd heard the drone of them, each one singing within the chorus. So what do you think of it here? It's beautiful, but I can't imagine growing up without connection. You don't like the feeling? Not really, I said. Being offline reminded me of my life back home before layers existed, when I'd lived with my parents in Ohio, a miserable time that technology had helped to bury. Do you? Totally, I could live like this forever. I looked at her in the dark and tried to scan her eyes, but it was just her looking back at me, familiar yet completely different. What about my dad? I like him, I said. That was only part of the truth. I was really thinking about how different he was from my own father. We never sat and ate dinner together or played board games. I'd heat up frozen pizza and eat in the kitchen while dad would lie on the couch watching whatever game was on. Eventually he'd get up, clink the bottles into the bin, and that was the sign to shut off the TV. Thinking about it made me feel like Katie and her father were playing a joke on me. There was no way people actually live like this without yelling, without fighting. I felt the warmth of Katie's hand against my chest. What's the matter? Nothing. You can tell me, she said. I love you. 
It was the first time she'd actually said the words. At home, it was just something we knew. We understood it from the moments when we'd stand brushing our teeth together, and the feeling would flash through her layers. And sometimes late at night, right before we'd both fall asleep, we'd reach out and touch each other's hands and feel it. I love you too, I managed to get out. And the weight of the words made something shift inside me. I felt the sentences forming in my head, the words lining up as though waiting to be released. Without my layers, there was nothing to keep them from spilling out. Katie, I said into the darkness, I want to tell you about my family. She put her arms around me. Okay. And there in the cabin, feeling Katie's body against mine, I began to speak. I didn't stop myself, but leaned into my voice and the comfort of hearing my words disappearing into the air with only Katie and the crickets as witnesses. It was that night in the cabin that helped us grow closer. Shortly after we returned, I unlocked more layers for her and showed her the pictures of my father and mother, the few I'd kept. There was my high school graduation, my mother's sunken eyes staring at the camera, my father with his hands in his pockets, and me in between, none of us happy. I showed her the dirty, vinyl-sided house and the denuded lawn, blasted by cold winters and the perpetual dripping oil from my father's truck. And she showed me her own hidden layers, her mother's funeral in a small church in Maine, her father escaping to the cabin afterwards, learning to cook dinner for herself. Having unlocked the bad memories, I also uncovered the few good ones I'd hidden. A snowy day, my father in a moment of tenderness, pulling me on a sled through town. My mother emerging from her room shortly before she died to give me a hug as I left for school. Feeling the closeness that sharing our layers brought, Katie suggested we give total openness a shot. It meant offering our most painful wounds as a gift to one another, a testament that there was no corner of the soul so ugly as to remain unshared. It had become increasingly common to see the couples in Brooklyn, a simple O tattooed around their fingers, announcing their radical honesty of the relationship to the world. They went to open house parties, held in abandoned meatpacking plants where partiers let down all their layers and displayed the infinite gradations of pain and joy to strangers, while DJs played break noise directly into their heads. I resented the couples, imagining them to be suburban hipsters who'd grown up with loving parents, regular allowances, and easy histories to share. Total openness seemed premature, I told Katie, not just for us, but for everyone. Our culture was still figuring out the technology. A decade after linking in, I'd find drinking episodes that had migrated to my work layer, or worse yet, porn clips that I had to flush back down into the darkness of my hidden layers. I'm not gonna judge you, she promised as, she lay in as we lay in bed. She put her leg over mine. You do realize how hot it'll be to know each other's fantasies, right? There were dozens of buzz posts about it, the benefits of total intimacy, how there was no more fumbling mistakes, no guessing, just a personal database of kinks that could be accessed by your partner. What about the darker layers? We need to uncover those too, Katie said. That's what love is, seeing all the horrible stuff and still loving each other. I thought I understood it then. And though my heart was in my throat, my terror so palpable that my body had gone cold, I was willing to believe that total openness wasn't the opposite of safety, but the only true guarantee of finding it. So late that summer evening, Katie and I sat on the bed, gazing into one another's eyes, and we gave each other total access. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what went wrong, whether total openness was to blame or not. Some days I think it was, that there's no way to, no way to share the totality of yourself and still be loved, that secrets are the glue that binds relationships together. Other times, I think Katie and I just weren't meant to be a couple for the long haul. Total openness just helped us find the end more quickly. Maybe it was nothing more than the limits of the software. We were the first generation to grow up with layers, a group of kids who'd produced thousands of tutorials on blocking unwanted users, but not a single one on empathy. There were certainly good things that came from openness, like how after finding my paintings, Katie surprised me with a sketch pad and drawing pencils or the nights when I'd come home from a frustrating day of substitute teaching, and she'd have accessed my mood long before I saw her. She'd lay me down on the bed and give me a massage without us even winking one another. But all too often, it was the things we didn't need to share that pierced our love, 
sexual histories that left Katie stewing for weeks, fleeting attractions to waiters and waitresses when we go out for dinner, momentary annoyances that would have been best left unshared. Letting someone into every secret gave access to our dark corners, and rather than feeling sympathy for each other's failings, we blamed each other for nearsightedness, and soon layers of resentment were dredged up. There was a night at the bar when I watched Katie struggling to speak loudly enough for the bartender to hear, and I suddenly realized his face resembled the schoolyard bully of her childhood. You have to get over that already, I blinked angrily. Soon after, while watching a film I wasn't enjoying, she tapped into layers I hadn't yet registered. He's just a fictional character, not your father. And then there was the final New Year's Eve party at her friend's place out in Bay Ridge. The party was Y2K themed and guests were expected to actually speak to one another. A bunch of partygoers were sporting Bluetooth headsets into which they yelled loudly. We listened to Jamiroquoi on a boombox and watched Teletubbies on a salvaged flat screen. Katie was enjoying herself. She danced to the songs and barely winked anyone, happy to be talking again. I tried to be sociable, but I was shut down, giving access only to my most superficial layers as everyone got drunk and sloppy with theirs. We stood talking to a guy wearing an ironic trucker's cap as he pretended we were in 1999. So you think the computers are going to blow up at midnight? He asked us. Katie laughed. No, I said. Come on, Katie blinked. Loosen up. I'm not into the kitsch, I blinked back. Mostly I'm just excited about faxing things, the guy in the trucker's cap joked, and Katie laughed again. You know faxing was the early 90s, right? I said, and then blinked to Katie. Are you flirting with this guy? All I'm saying is check out this Bluetooth. Can you believe folks wore these? I know, that's crazy, Katie said. No, I'm not flirting, I'm talking. How about you try it for a change? I told you, I don't like talking. Great, so you're never gonna wanna talk then? Did you guys make any New Year's resolutions? The guy asked us. Yeah, Katie said, looking at me, to talk more. In her annoyance, an image from a deeper layer flashed into clear resolution. It was a glimpse of a future she'd imagined for herself. And I saw us canoeing in Maine, singing songs with our kids. Even though we discussed how I never wanted children, there they were. And while I hadn't sung aloud since grade school, there was a projection of me singing. Only then did I see the other incongruities. My eyes were blue, not brown. My voice buoyant, my physique way more buff than I ever planned to become. And though I shared similarities with the man in the canoe, as if Katie had tried to fit me into his mold, the differences were clear. There, in the canoe, was the family Katie wanted, and the man with her wasn't me. What the fuck, I said out loud. It's just a question, the guy said. If it's personal, you don't have to share. I'm giving up gluten. Excuse us for a moment, I said, and I blinked for Katie to follow me. We found a quiet spot by the side of a flat screen TV. Who the hell is that in your future? I'm really sorry, she said, looking at me. I do love you, but I'm not the guy you want to spend your life with? Ten, nine, eight, the partiers around us counted as they streamed the feed from Times Square. That's not true. Katie said, you're almost everything I want. There was no conscious choice about what happened next, just an instinctive recoiling of our bodies, the goosebumps rising against my skin as our layers closed to one another. I couldn't access the lake house anymore or the photos of her father. Her childhood dog was gone, followed by the first boyfriend in her college years, until all that was left were my own private memories, trapped deep within my layers, and the pale tint of her skin in the television's light. We were strangers again, and we stood there looking at each other while all around us, the party counted down the last seconds of the old year. I logged off for long periods after we broke up. I gave up on trying to convince my students to have real life experiences. When they complained that reading the I Have a Dream speech was too boring, I let them stream a thrash hop version instead. And I sat looking out the window, thinking about Katie. I walked to my station alone every day and sat on the train with my sketch pad, drawing the details I remembered from our trip to Maine, the shoreline with its broken shells and sunlight, the heron before it took flight, Katie's face in the summer darkness. It's the intangible details that I remember the clearest, the ones that there's no way to draw. 
the taste of perch as we sat around the table, how a cricket had slipped through the screened windows and jumped around our bed that night, how after we'd gotten it out, the coolness of the lake made us draw the blankets up around us, and how Katie, her father and I, had sat together in the warm light of the living room and played a game, the letter dice clattering as her father shook the plastic container. All right, Andy, you ready? He'd asked me, holding his hand over the lid. And I thought I was. Thank you. All right, I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have, or whatever you'd like to talk about, within reason. So I'm sort of curious. The collection, as I understand it, is uh, so it's all sort of very near future, uh, about sort of human experience, I guess, in this, in this world where uh, you and I suppose your readers uh, in the future, right, uh, are kind of looking at our own anxieties about the modern world around us that's changing so rapidly with our new technologies. Uh, what I thought was interesting was, however, that in, in the story you just read. There was also this touch of standard things that have existed as part of our anxiety for you know the entire existence of humankind. Uh, the act of even trying to share certain things with people, with or without technology, to assist you mm -hmm. talking about your family life if it wasn't so positive, things like this. And so I'm, I'm curious, not just with this story, but with the other stories in your collection, what, what sort of inspired this this combination of technological anxiety along with kind of the aging? primitive human anxiety. Great, and I'll, I'll repeat the question, right? Um, since we're doing a recording, and let's see if I can summarize that. The um, technology that this, this collection deals a lot with technology, right, in this sort of future, maybe 20 to 50 years forward, and yet a lot of the anxieties that people deal with, including this story, aren't technological per se, right? They're the kind of age-old anxieties of sharing yourself with the family or connection between somebody or breaking up, yeah? And so the question is, one more time, how do I see that working or how do I see? How do you see that and how are you uh, working to explore those concepts together using this setting? Yeah, great, so how do I use technology to, to explore that? So I think a lot of the stories come from my fumbling and bumbling with technology. Like, I'm not that tech savvy at all, right? It, if anybody that wants me to look something up when we're, you know, we're, let's get an Uber even. It takes me like forever, right? And people are very bored with me by then. And so I notice often where these kind of anxieties show up, right? So I've been talking recently about these new emotions we have, like the emotion of an empty inbox. Like, what is that emotion? What is the emotion of an unliked Facebook post, right? If you use Facebook and you post something, nobody likes it, right? There's an emotion you feel there, which is a kind of isolation or a sadness from that, right? And a dating profile. What about an un unmessaged dating profile, right? There are these, I think in many ways, I'm often dealing with loneliness in my stories. Or, and, and then looking at how technology kind of exacerbates these opportunities for loneliness. So now we could have an em empty inbox, you know, often throughout the day. Uh, we can have a post that's unliked that we can check, you know, 20 times and still see that it's unliked. You know, nobody, nobody did anything with it. So that started me on that. I mean, the first story in this collection, which took 10 years to write, right? So this is a 10 year old collection, at least the, the, the oldest story is, was my computer crashed and it took a lot of my creative work with it at that moment, and I was deeply distraught. I mean, I was you know, really sad. It also was a computer that I'd written a lot of stories on, so I had this emotional connection. And I realized, oh wow, we're getting emotionally connected with our technology. I, and right around that time, everybody was getting iPhones, my students. And my students would say, boy, just don't let me lose my iPhone. I love my iPhone. If I had to lose anything, I think they would sacrifice you know, sometimes distant relatives before their, their phone. And I, I said, wow, this is a really strange phenomenon. We're more and more getting emotionally connected in ways that I don't think we fully understand how they're playing out yet. And they reveal to us deeper anxieties and emotions. And, and with each new 
uh, progression of technology, I, I tend to find more anxieties in some ways that, that they produce. Yeah, the question is, have I read Sherry Turkle's Alone Together? I haven't, and I'm so thrilled, though, that she's changed her opinion. Uh, because I remember about 10 years ago, she was talking about how the internet is this wonderful place, and it is, but a wonderful place where we're going to connect with other people. And she was just, you know, kind of uh, effusive about it. And now she has done a complete 180, so I, I really want to read it. Have you read it? Second self, right? Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to reading uh, and avatars and all that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading uh, that book because I think she's a partner in crime right now, so to speak. Yeah. Hi. So, first epiphany comment. There are those of us, well, the feeling of an empty inbox may not be the same for all the summer. Of the summer. <laughs> <laughs> right. The empty inbox as, as relief. Yeah, so right, I forget. Yeah. Something I'm very curious to, to know what your kind of personal thoughts on are. Like, so these, these stories represent an imagining of the future. Yeah. Can you imagine the future that you actually want to live in 25 to 50 years from now? What would you imagine? Great. So the question is, because these stories envision the future, when I envision my own personal, like if I could create, which I am, right, but this is a dystopian future, is the question... It, right, right. Uh, it's the question. The question is, what kind of future would I like to see, thirty to fifty years? Um, yeah, it's very different from these stories. In many ways, these stories are warnings. I think of, please, let's not go down this this road. And unfortunately, a lot of reality is catching up to this. So we were talking about Google Glass recently, and and then moving into contact lenses. Now a lot of research is going into like these eye screens and contact lenses. And I don't see that as a good thing, right? I, I write about that in here. I see that as us getting even more lost or virtual reality is on its way. And I, I imagine I've been following teledildonics, not personally, but if you don't know what teledildonics are, it, it's what it sounds like. Uh, it's virtual sex toys that can be, you, you all know, yeah? I mean, I'm here at Google, so I'm sure you all know what this is. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, maybe there's a workshop somewhere building these here, right? Uh, and so I see like that we're heading more and more away from one another. Uh, in teledildonics, I can imagine that eventually we'll have a kind of Facebook of safe sex happening where you just log on and you have sex with whoever is on these sites. And then if you don't look like what they actually look like, you'll probably be able to change their avatar to look exactly like the type of person you want to sleep with, which the problem will be that we won't be able to deal with each other anymore and the actual flaws of human beings uh, or growing old or you know these kind of natural things. So those are the warnings in here. I would love to see, uh, for one, wind and solar power becoming, you know, that in 30 to 50 years, fossil fuels, we're done with that, fracking has been acknowledged as a horrible idea uh, for all reasons, including our drinking water, which we may decide is important to actually have water to drink, perhaps. Uh, and so instead, there will be much more clean energy primarily, right? And that, I guess, a kind of locavore movement where we're using a lot more obviously organic farming, local farms, locally sourced. We're seeing that happening. There is that kind of uh, revolution happening. It's very connected also to the internet, right? So you have Etsy and you have these stores where if you're local, you can then use that. Or somebody was telling me about this app where she cans vegetables and people want to learn how to can vegetables. And so you can sign up for this group or this teaching and then show up there. So somehow using the internet in these community building ways and in many ways giving up marketing of, right? So not using the internet in order to search people's information in order to exploit them so you can better sell stuff. Now I understand that the, the myth around this is 
that if you can predict people's buying patterns, all the better. We can have all our preferences ready. Like I could walk in the bathroom and in my ears will be my favorite song playing, right? And the world is streamlined to me. And I don't think that's a great idea because I think it's increasing narcissism, right? There's a way that for the world to be always built to my preferences, that's not, that doesn't teach me anything, right? It's, it's when I have to struggle with, oh, you don't feel the same way I do, why not? Maybe it's because I'm an asshole about this and I need to learn that. Many people, I think, need to learn moments like that, right? Um, so to that extent, I hope to see many more like positive uses of the internet where it's not to, in order to exploit us to profit. Again, clean energy, um, I think Native American, like, you know, I'm looking at the Dakota Access Pipeline and all these Native American tribes coming back together. It'd be wonderful to see the, the US government uh, sort of acknowledge them and take care of them and, and learn about these sort of sacred traditions a little more. So, I mean, I get to just tout all of, since you asked, all of my favorite topics, and that's my hopes. Yeah, that's my hope. Uh, and I haven't started writing those stories yet, right? They're, those are utopian stories rather than dystopian. And I've thought a lot about what do those stories look like? You know, that what happens when you try to imagine a better future? And I think the, the key on a fiction craft level is what's the conflict then, right? How do you write stories of joy or stories of hope that have hope as their primary thing rather than as conflict? Uh, I haven't figured that out yet. Maybe in a second or third, third book. Uh, maybe I'll figure it out in the next couple of years. Yeah. The follow-up question is, would Teledildonics be an amazing name for a punk band? Absolutely. You should start that. <laughs> I would come out to that show for sure. That sounds amazing. Yeah. So I like your remark where you say that actually internet grows us up, makes us move apart. But I have a comment on that. I would like to hear your Yes. Don't you think that we as a world come closer and we as individuals that are closer come apart? Like one example is that I grew up 10,000 miles away from here, and I know what my classmates that still live there are doing, so I'm closer to them. But I might be apart from my wife, who actually lives in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. So this notion of closeness and apartness of the internet. So the example, to repeat the question, is for example, you've moved very far away from your school friends, but you can connect to them through the internet, and yet potentially your wife in the same room, you're not as close to because of checking out the profiles of the friends from distance away. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody can nod yes to this experience. If we've ever been out to dinner with somebody or a group of friends and they're all on their phones, uh, and essentially what we're just doing is sharing space in order to eat food, I, I think, and get a vestige of what human interaction was once like, um, and then maybe you share a video, right? Yeah, I do think that we stay connected. I mean, here's the benefits, right? There's plenty of benefits, of course, to the internet, and that you can re refine these friends. And then actually, you know, now that I'm on book tour, I get to see old friends that only know that I'm here because of the internet, right? Very, really great. In some ways, though, it also reveals the hypothetical friendships, right? We were talking about this at lunch, that one has, on Facebook, you have these friends that hypothetically you're still friends with, right? You've liked that they just had a kid or that, you know, they put some new flowers in their yard and they've liked, you know, something you did that you had a good lunch somewhere. And because of those little likes, we feel connected. But then actually showing up in their town and like seeing, hey, would you like to get together for a drink is like too much, you know, no, 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 can't do that. But, um, or you don't get a response until, you know, weeks later and saying, oh, sorry, I missed you, right? Or if you have to move, this is always the thing. Will the people show up to help you move? I think we are growing more disconnected in that way. Um, video gaming culture in some ways is a perfect example where you have people with very strong communities online. They're gaming and they have their friends online and it's international. And, and this is not to denigrate that, right? That's, that's profound for, for people and it's a meaningful relationship. And yet their wives or girlfriends are in bed waiting for them to come 
back to bed and fall asleep without them because they're there playing the video games for the next three or four hours. This is a common, and not to gender it, I mean, it can be the opposite gender, but I've heard a lot of women complaining about this recently, about these sort of lost boyfriends to uh, World of Warcraft or whatever the game is. So, yeah, it's a really weird conundrum that we have where I think we're connected with so many more people, but on an intimate level, on a one-to-one -one basis, it's getting more fraught. It's up to us, I think, to overcome that and really make those, those moments of contact with one another. Does that get at with the same question? For, right, is this a good or bad thing for, for all of mankind? My feeling is it's not that good where we're seeing, that I think we're getting way more connected out there. Um, I'm going to say that with a caveat in a moment, right? That interpersonally, no, it's not that good. I think, you know, I was talking with my students and they, I asked them about dating nowadays. I said, would you call somebody that you were interested in dating? And they said, no, of course you wouldn't call. I was like, why not? And they said, well, because then you hear their voice. Right? As though that was self-evident, right? Then you'd actually have to hear their voice. And I said, well, are you kidding me? Like, you're going to have to hear their voice at some point. But at least texting for a long period of time, they could avoid that interpersonal contact. So I do think that it's a bad thing in that we are moving further away from actual communities. And in some ways, evidence of this, I think our physical landscapes in many places are deteriorating. So we have empty houses, empty strip malls. Um, I mentioned fracking and all sorts of uh, flammable water. I mean, God knows what else is going on here where I think our landscape deteriorates and yet as we move into the virtual world, we're gonna be able to have the most beautiful landscapes ever imagined. And that will be preferable to the landscapes that we're leaving behind, which is actually the world of which we need to survive on. The caveat is, on another way, it makes us way more socially active and progressive and aware. So I've been mentioning the Dakota Pipeline. I wouldn't know about that. A lot of people would not know that that's going on without the internet, right? Uh, police brutality, uh, sort of social injustice and ways of fighting that. Again, you have to be on the ground to fight it, right? I mean, there's a way that you can just be an activist by clicking, <laughs> like, I support, like, or, you know. And I don't know that how much that does. I think you do have to be out in the streets, so to speak. But I, I'd say that's a really benefit to the humankind, that we know about things that previously were buried. So uh, you obviously just talked a lot about how um, some technologies subtract away from the human social Any uh, technologies today or in the future that will be additive to the good good question, yeah. The question is so I'm talking about how technologies take away from this human infrastructure, right? This human connection. What technologies can I can I again this is almost like a utopian question, right? Could I invent a technology? Are there technologies that exist um, that can bring us closer together? And of course those exist. I mean this app that I was talking about where people can now, you know, promote what they're doing and teach canning, right, or something like this. And this was an interesting conversation with the person because they said, well, when the people show up, what I realized was everybody was taking notes on their phones while they're trying to learn canning and, you know, take pictures and then they ended up on their, on their uh, email. And so the woman said, I have to actually take the phones away during this, which is very akin to teaching. What would be some great technologies here? I mean, obviously drinking water, I, I start thinking immediately of nature, right? So drinking water is going to become an issue uh, for us. And so technologies wherein it helps us to purify drinking water and uh, that kind of technology, unlimited energy power, you know, uh, clean energies and technologies for that, ways of connecting to people in the community to help build more local, social, and uh, ex sort of those kind of technologies. And that exists. I mean, that's already there, right? Um, I think probably what I'm looking at, uh, this is just this kick that I'm on recently, 
is do the technologies try to exploit you in some way, the apps we're using, right? Do they try to exploit your info in order to sell you something? Is there a commodification happening to our interactions? And I think often there is, right? This is one of the things that we are building a lot of technologies on is how can we get that? That's usually, I'm just gonna make a broad statement here, I think that usually leads to a negative thing because then we learn to sell out our friends to some degree. So the benefits would be, a beneficial technology is somehow where you use it, it's not selling out your friends and in fact it's helping you uh, help other people. So we have things like that, GoFundMe and um, many of these kind of funding things where you can create a way to help somebody get their dream started, I think is fantastic, right? And more of those types of things. Certainly there's these spiritual uh, apps that are coming out and I don't know what to think about these yet, right? So like meditation apps and you can then meditate with them. And that's definitely better if you're waiting for the bus for 10 minutes to meditate than crush candy or like launch angry birds at something. I have to think that's gonna make us more conscious and well-rounded and meditative people. And that of course can go further and further, right? I mean, one of the things that uh, Terence McKenna and Jaron Lanier talk about is virtual reality becoming these landscapes wherein we can have our wildest dreams and these sort of beautiful, um, almost psychedelic landscapes that we'll enter into. I could see, I, on the way over here, I was thinking, wow, what if you had these glasses, again, right, or these, these contacts that let you see bioenergetics of people, right? Or you looked at a tree and you could suddenly see the sap going through all the leaves and you could see kind of fractal-like patterns all around. So what were you seeing? You're seeing a more cosmic vision. That would be cool, <laughs> right? I'm trying to figure out what the problem with that is because I'm always looking at, well, where would the problem be? And maybe like at the ends of the leaves, it says, you know, if you like this leaf, click here, you know, and whatever, you know. Uh, would you like a new pair of shoes along with the aura that you're seeing <laughs> or something like that? That's the problem. Again, I always go towards marketing. But I think things that make us more conscious and more connected are, is the way to go. And, and so the question is that in many ways, the, with some of the evidence we have, diversity of, of thought and difference is minimizing, right? And so in this story, these characters are sharing everything, and would that make them more homogenous, essentially, right? It's almost a retainer with each other by sharing. Yeah, so this, this idea of even though one's sharing everything, how do you retain your individuality in there and not become just kind of part of the global think mind, right? Yeah, and immediately I'm thinking about Buddhism and Taoism and these, no, you know, these spiritualities of which one tries to attain that, right? This selfless, universal consciousness. And I mentioned McKenna. McKenna also sort of prophes prophesized this where we're using all these gadgets just because we need an external validation of our own internal capabilities. We could actually pull all this information through the kind of psychic abilities or the, the super conscious abilities that the brain has. We just haven't accessed it yet, so we need external validation. That's a more positive, in some ways, approach than the question uh, is asking because, you know, and, and so maybe part of the question then is, what's the distinction between those two paths? Because one is a shrinking of consciousness, it almost seems, right? There's a lack of diversity. There's uh, less of your individuality. And that, you know, again, and I keep going back, that's a good thing in, in Buddhism. <laughs> one wants that, you wanna transcend the ego. Uh, and here we go back to like good technologies, like sure, what if we had technologies that helped us transcend our egos? My God, if we could ship one to Donald Trump, we would maybe, you know, see a whole different story here. All the, all the we'll give it to all the candidates out there and see what happens uh, as an experiment. The difference I think tends to be where it then leads us to, right? In this story, the real danger becomes that the character is sharing 
stuff that ends up making him unlikable, which is what he fears. Right? And, and this knowledge of each other's weak points without a development of compassion, empathy, and general expansion of consciousness makes us probably less likely to be empathetic and, and, and care for other people. Right? This was kind of what I was talking about with the preferences, where there's a way that maybe by always having our preferences, we're, we're minimizing our ability to deal with other people. Right? Certainly, we could see this in beauty standards where the airbrushing and the photoshopping make real people not as attractive, quote, big quotes around attractive. And so this kind of blurring of those boundaries leads us into a predefined homogenous place that's being defined again by outside forces, right? which isn't, isn't really the problem here except they're living in a society where that probably is exerting this pressure, now that I'm thinking about this, this part of it. Like, why wouldn't sharing everything with your partner be a great thing? Well, because you, if you've tried it, it's not always a great thing, right? Uh, there are things that sometimes are too, too problematic. Um, and that's, that was what I was making fun of in this story. But I think this kind of overcoming our own egos and overcoming, and, and also, having compassion for one another, we're not developing that as quickly as we're developing our technology. And so the two things are being outpaced. Uh, our, own, our own psychic and moral development isn't keeping pace with the technological stuff. And that's where the problems come in. Otherwise, I think we might find a greater diversity of who we really are. Right. Um, but it's a fantastic question. I'm, I'm interested in thinking about that even, even more and seeing where is that difference lie between what you're showing, uh, seeing with the statistics of limited diversity, but not in a good way. Not like we're all one, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for coming to visit and talk about your books. Yeah, thanks so much.